All right, let's uh, start the presentations. Hello, everyone. I want to welcome everyone here to the final project presentations for the winter 24 class of robotic systems and control. And we have 12 groups who are going to be presenting, six of them today and six of them next week. And uh, I have gone through the projects they are going to present, it, and it sounds like really fun and interesting work. I'm looking forward to that. Um, so just a couple of quick uh, instructions for all the groups who are going to present today. Uh, first thing is that uh, when you start your presentation, start with, uh, uh, start with uh, the title slide, introduce your project, and every group member says, introduces themselves, followed by the demonstration video, and then go into presentation. Everyone will have 20 minute time slot. And uh, 15 minutes are reserved for your demonstration and presentation. I will, I will interrupt when we are getting near the end of 15 minutes because we'll reserve five minutes for question answer. Okay, so these are the general thing. Make sure that when you present, it's the full screen. Everything is full screen and your video is full screen. And the sound, if there is sound, make sure sound is on. All right, so with that, uh, we have a couple of guests. If they want to introduce themselves, please go ahead now. Happy to, thank you, Professor Mirza. Yeah, Dan Stewart with Automation Alley. We are a proud partner of Oakland University and, um, and, and specifically the ARC Center and Looking forward to continuing collaboration with the university. But we're a small nonprofit out of Troy, Michigan, where we try and accelerate knowledge on behalf of small manufacturers who are chasing digital transformation. Thank you, Dan. And we are always happy to have you at our presentations. And I know you asked very interesting questions. So we look forward to those. <laughs> um, anybody else, they want to introduce themselves? Uh -huh. Ishra, can you mute your mic? Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Anybody else wants to introduce? Um, hey, yeah, my name is John Allison. Uh, I'm with Haptic Studios and Great Lakes Reality Labs. Uh, we are a motion capture studio uh, as well as a software development company um, uh, located in Lansing, Michigan. Um, so very excited to see all the uh, different robotics uh, uh, experiments and, and kind of get to know uh, what's going on here. Don't have too much uh, personal experience with robotics. Uh, we've worked with a couple teams uh, in um, the high school competitions. But other than that, just excited to learn and, and hopefully ask some thoughtful questions. Welcome, John. And uh, I'm sure that you'll enjoy it the creative side of the students doing their final project also. And maybe you can give some tips also. So that'll sure. be very welcome. <laughs> any any other guests who want to introduce themselves? Yeah, um, my name is James Wallace. I had Dr. Mirza for ECE 4500 about five years ago. Um, I am a robotic controls engineer at ThyssenKrupp Automation Engineering. So I program robots every day. I write software standards. And um, right now I'm coming to you live from my hotel room uh, mm -hmm. in Cleveland, Ohio, because I travel a lot for uh, different automotive plants. So uh, yeah, welcome James. And it's good to see your familiar face. So yep. would you say that that course will help you build your career? Yeah, yeah. Um, though, you know, I, I know a lot of it is matrix math, right? Um, I don't do that much of it, but still the, the basic principles of how the frames work are very important. Um, especially choosing, you know, I have end effectors on robots that are very complex. You have to choose where you want your, your tool frames to be, um, setting where you want your, your user frames in space. It's all very important. So, and the lab was very fun too. So it's good. I don't, are you guys, did you do pro, uh, your projects in the lab or is it virtual now? Uh, they were done in the lab. So they all okay. experienced it and that's where the demos are going to be. 
So great, you know, uh, keep your questions so you can ask them as, as we show different projects. I'm sure you'll have great questions too. Anybody else who want to introduce themselves? Yes, hi, uh, Professor. This is Joe Wideven from AVB. Uh, just uh, again, glad to be here. I've seen this now for a few years and uh, uh, always excited to see what they're doing with the robots. So um, again, I'll just kind of give, uh, can't wait to see it kind of talk about uh, what we do in the real world and and how it applies to what they're doing. And again, looking forward to seeing what they have. Welcome, Joe. And it's always good to have you in these presentations also. And um, I see Onesta Ones also. Would you like to introduce yeah. yourself? Hi. So my name is Onesta. I am the College Relations Specialist over at MALA. Uh, we are a leading international development partner and supplier to the automotive industry, as well as a pioneer for the mobility of the future. Um, so I work with um, all of our internships, um, co-ops, um, do all the recruiting and our university relations. Uh, we also do uh, partner with ARC as well at Oakland. So very excited to see what everyone has uh, to show us today. Welcome, Anissa. And uh, I, I'm happy to have everyone here, all the guests. Uh, the students appreciate that. Uh, they like to show off their what they have done. I have to mention that all the projects you're going to see were done within four weeks. So they had a very short time. They learned how to program robots and to figure out how to do the application. So a lot was accomplished along with the other coursework and other things which were happening. So I know they may not look perfect and all, but they learned a whole lot. And that's the whole idea behind this, that you try out something, try to make it work as much as you can. So I'm really excited to, uh, to see what the uh, groups have accomplished. And with that, I'm gonna invite group number one, who is going to show us how a robot becomes an electrical engineer. Go ahead. Uh, Andrew, you can share your screen and start. Can you all see the screen? Yes, we can. All righty, take it away. Okay, so we're group one and we taught this robot to be an electrical engineer. Uh, my name is Andrew McGee. I'm Matthew Monroe. I'm Andrew Pettit. I'm George Trubiano. All right. Let's get this demonstration.
All right. So in that video, we saw that our robot was able to successfully assemble a simple LED circuit with a DC motor. We ran this process at a slower speed to ensure that the components would properly snap together and to ensure that the switches were flipped without damaging them. Now, I'm sure many of you could see that uh, this required a special robot, which we're going to move on to in the next slide. For this project, we used the KUKA KR6R700. We chose this robot because it has the largest workspace of all available robots in this course. Although we did not utilize it all, having a larger workspace gave us the confidence and freedom to develop any process we could think of. Additionally, the KUKA Teach Pendant was very user-friendly compared to some of the other robots during the point setting process. It had several options for user input with the choice of either a joystick, buttons, or a stylus. We also liked the robot's safety features. The use of a safety key and a two-factor dead man switch were excellent additions to ensure our safety during the robot's operation. The two-factor dead man switch would stop the robot's operation if it was squeezed too hard or let go of. This means that the robot would only operate if the correct amount of pressure was applied to the dead man switch. With all of these features, I'm going to pass things off to George, where he's going to tell us how and what we were able to accomplish with all of these phenomenal features. Uh, so in general, the task we wanted the robot to accomplish was to assemble a small circuit. Uh, initially, uh, we wanted to grab integrated circuits and place them onto a PCB. But uh, during testing, we found that due to the size of the legs on each chip, we wouldn't be uh, precise enough to place them within the holes. Um, since we still wanted to incorporate circuit building into the robot, uh, we, we decided to use snap circuits, which would lower the need for accuracy. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the snap circuits work by connecting to each other using larger connectors, as you can see in the picture. Um, the circuits we decided to build is a simple one, as Andrew mentioned earlier. Um, all it is is just uh, an LED where once the switch is uh, actuated, uh, the LED would illuminate, and once the second switch, which is just a push button, is pressed, uh, the motor would um, actuate. Um, when teaching each point, the point-to-point -point function on the teach pendant was used. Um, this command uses inverse kinematics to find the proper angles to set each joint uh, to in order to reach the point uh, desired. Um, before each point was taught, the arm has to be positioned manually. Um, and then after that, it is saved in the program. After, so then when you run it, it'll go to that point. Um, for grabbing each component, uh, the actuate gripper command was used. And all that does is basically it activates the pneumatic system, which allows compressed air to open and close the gripper. So one of the main issues that we ran into with this process is the the tooling on the the robot was a little bit bigger than all the parts when it was closed. So to counteract that, we printed off a little bit of a, I guess, wedge, as you can see on the side, um, to kind of lessen the gap between each side of the, the tool. Um, and that just allows us to like, get around the pieces a lot easier. Um, the issues with connecting the parts came when we went to press them down, it would slip up in our tool end. And to counteract this, we put a little bit of like athletic tape around the end of the tool, just to stop it from slipping up further into the tool end as we went to go press down a piece. Um, the same issue kind of showed up when we were trying to, I guess, press them down onto the thing. They would pop up a little bit because the way that the, the circuit's made, it's a little like buttons. So they snap into one another. But if you don't put enough pressure on it, it'll it'll lift up a little bit, and that kind of caused it to become a little bit shifted. So with that, we had to make sure we pressed down enough that it would hold, but not too much that it would break it or bend our, the kind of tools we made. Uh, so yep, now moving on to what we could actually improve on in the future if we had more time to work on, on this. 
Uh, the big thing is making a bigger circuit. Um, as you can see in this image, uh, there's way more components than we had in our circuit. Um, that's kind of due to some limitations. The actual kit we bought uh, didn't have as many components as shown in this image. So we would definitely like to increase that. Um, and then also another big thing is increasing the speed. Uh, as you probably saw in the video for some of the larger movements, uh, the robot moved quite slow. Um, just due to lack of time, we didn't get to uh, make everything as quick as we wanted to. Um, <clears throat> and then the last point, uh, we would actually, you know, go back to our original idea and use, uh, attempt to use, um, you know, IC chips or transistors or resistors uh, and put those into perf board, as you can see in this uh, bottom image here. Uh, the, the holes are very small on that. And, you know, with especially IC chips, uh, fitting those perfectly into those holes uh, was quite difficult to begin with. Um, and we would, you know, with time, we could improve on that. And uh, in order to do that, we would actually need to develop special tooling. Uh, so we don't, when the gripper closes, it doesn't actually damage uh, the IC chips or transistors. So uh, those are definitely some factors we need to think about for the future. And with that, uh, we're gonna throw it over to uh, questions. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you, Group One. Good job, good demo. Okay, can you unshare your screen now? Okay, um, so I guess we can give your robot the EE degree. He has become an electrical engineer. <laughs> All right, <laughs> we'll open up for questions from the anyone here. Please go ahead if you have a question. Sure, I have a question for you guys. Um, when you were you know, when you were teaching your points and setting it up for your display, did you have trouble finding the, um, you know, when you program your position, did you have trouble setting the parts that you were picking up in the right spot? If that makes sense? Uh, yeah, we, we did have a bit of trouble. Uh, you're asking like actually connecting the parts together. Was that your more? Your no, like, like, you know, you had your board and then mm -hmm. uh, where you were actually picking everything up from, were you having trouble like, when you'd set up your demo to where you were setting all the components so that you could pick them in the right spot? Uh, initially, yes, but we just use a piece of tape as more of a landmark and would constantly set it in around the same spot so that it would grab it around the same. Cause when we, you would just, you know, put it in around the same spot, it would sometimes grab it at an angle or not directly in the center, which obviously when you're training point to point like that is, uh, can cause issues when there's any change like that. So yes, we did do some standard. So that's an excellent question, James. Uh, the, what we talked about a little bit in the class is the accuracy of the whole application is how accurately can you pick and place, right? So the part has to be very accurately available. So when it's picked up, it's exactly how it's supposed to be. So when you go and place it, you can even insert it in the breadboard or those through holes, uh, the robots are very accurate. You know, uh, more more than more than accurate than you need. But it's the fixture. You have to design a fixture where the parts are available at a very high accuracy. So James Rader, a very good point. And uh, we talked a little bit. Of course, you know, this uh, demonstration. This is what I wanted you guys to experience. That these issues is what lowers the accuracy of if you're trying to do, and and you have to. Uh, actually uh, think about those things in real industrial applications. Yeah, more yep. more questions for this group? Yeah, I have one, I, I just like, well, not really a question, more an observation. I think I, I really enjoy the creativity of the adaptation. I loved that you were having trouble with the gripper and so you created some wedges. That was, that was, that was adaptation at its finest, I love that. And the fact that you use tape to facilitate the, the gripping function as well. So just uh, just a acknowledgement more than anything else. Well done. <laughs> That's a good point, Dan. And I, I would say there was a forced creativity because I forbid them to change the gripper on the robots. Uh, uh, <laughs> so they okay. have to devise something they can slip on and slip off quickly before the next group comes and takes over the robot. <laughs> so yeah, they did, uh, most of the groups adjusted the 3D printer or used tape and other stuff, yeah. came up with creative solutions. <laughs> Good job. Um, I have a question for the group is, um, 
you you think a force control would have helped here? You said you pushed the parts and all, and you were using basically position control there. What do you guys think? Um, you can answer. I mean, I, I it definitely would have helped because we did have uh, at some point where we did push too hard and it snapped one of the pieces we were using. So force control definitely would have helped a little bit. So that's that's a good point. We th that would have been a good idea to add. Okay, well, good job. Any last questions for the group? Yeah, hey, uh, this is Joe again. This is that was really interesting, kind of fun. The hey, we're doing this for real. Like we are using robots, and our customers are buying solutions to do electrical work like that, like you know, electronics. Um, you know, in the real in the real world, and making stuff at a production rate, right? So. Very, very cool. Um, good concepts. The uh, Again, I'll, and I'll just add on to it too. Like the robot is super accurate and you'll find that you have to really be careful about your tolerances because your end of arm tools, if they're not, don't have the right tolerances, your, your uh, stationary positions, if they don't have the right tolerances, the robot can go to the same place every time, but it's when you start to tolerance stack that uh, you can get into trouble. So um, I understand you were restricted because you couldn't change the end of arm tool. I get it. But just again, some food for thought, especially when you're dealing with uh, electronics and those small component boards. So nice job. Thank you, Joe. And uh, it's one of the things I want them uh, when they selected the project is uh, you cannot, you probably won't be able to do very accurate because of the tooling. And again, the limitation on the tooling is um, li limiting factor here. Uh, but I wanted them to experience that, and they did, and they and they did a workaround. So they changed from breadboard to snap, and they understand all that. But excellent points, Joe. That in real world, these robots are super accurate and can easily do this kind of assembly in uh, through holes and breadboard. All right, good job once again. Uh, we're gonna move on to group number two. And they are doing sh shell switcheroo. So take it away. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Nicholas Sanawi. Um, I'm Paul Madhar. And our project is Shell Switcheroo, which is the shell game. Next slide.
So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that video. Um, so as we all know, um, robots are used in many different applications and in many different industries. Uh, they're used for several industrial applications such as manufacturing, assembly, welding, machining, um, pelletizing, um, and dispensing. Um, they are also used in many other industries such as entertainment, uh, healthcare and medicine, um, agriculture, and military applications as well. So for our project, we uh, decided to show an entertainment application of the robot. Um, in doing so, we had the robot display how the shell game works, which you guys saw in the video. And this was done using the Fanic LR Mate robot. Next slide. So um, our mapping diagram um, is composed of three sequences. Um, the first sequence is, um, so the robot's in the home position. And the first sequence is it grabs the shell and moves it to position two, which is the middle position. And the second sequence is uh, putting the cups in each uh, individual position. And um, the last sequence, um, it's mixing up the uh, the cups to like show the shell game and hide the shell and move it around and have the whoever is guessing figure out which one it's in. Um, and of course, you can add more sequences to that and make it more of a complex game. But um, the robots can only move so quick and hide the shell so good. So, um, yep. Okay. Uh, so to implement this project, uh, we had to use the two frame uh, method to ensure full joint rate motion. Um, we used the uh, point to point method. We had to uh, manually set points uh, for the robot to grab the cup and to move the cup. Um, so uh, the issue that we had uh, was we, ne we needed to make sure that it wouldn't tip over the cup. So we had to set multiple points because um, it would uh, go the shortest distance to the next uh, point if we didn't have those many points uh, set in the controller. Um, we were successfully able to move the cups um, and we did multiple runs uh, and f for this game and it was able to move the cups and uh, we were able to completely finish the game every time. And um, the robot uh, con it consistently grabbed all the cups and we didn't have any issues of cup dropping or um, or, or colliding with any other um, uh, different cups. So problems and issues that we faced Problems and issues that we faced were mostly with the tool gripper itself, not knowing the dimensions ahead of time. So the cup handles that we installed ourselves had to be completely changed as soon as we got to the to the lab. So due to that fact, we had to start adjusting the cup grips and the cup handles that were made for the robot to grab and place were also a big issue that went hand in hand with the tool gripper. So the cup grips were evenly shaped at, at the start, but the tool gripper only has two settings, which is on or off, which we didn't account for. I thought there would be a percentage that we can insert fully or go 50% in and 50% out. So because of that, fully pinching our handles, the shape of the handles was completely ruined. So every time it would be placed, it was a different orientation. Um, so next time, so the next time the same cup that needed to be picked up and placed, the pinching point of the handle itself would flare out and it would cause collisions, which we had to remake cups constantly to keep up with this game. Um, in conclusion, this project was successful at what we wanted to demonstrate. This demonstrated the consistent accuracy throughout this whole project. Multiple test runs were done. Overall, this project highlights the extensive and exciting potentials of robotics and entertainment and everyday life activities rather than the manufacturing side and it's also providing a fresh fresh game in a new way instead of you know using it yourself but thank you thank you for listening questions thank you group number two uh can you uh unshare the screen
Okay, good job and good demo. Okay, uh, we are gonna start the question, but I can say that your robot can go on New York streets if you just make it a little faster. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we are open to questions for this group. Um, hey, yeah, this is uh, John Allison. Um, I was wondering, um, it seemed like uh, you guys uh, had, you know, uh, issues with the flippers that you worked out pretty well. Um, and uh, you mentioned that uh, every time was a success. Um, seemed to me like a, kind of a potential unforeseen issue could have been the shell itself. So I was just wondering if you had any issues with, um, you know, that slipping out of the cup when the uh, robot arm was moving it, or if you had to kind of adjust the height um, for that particular cup uh, while you were uh, programming everything. Yeah, we did have that exact issue actually. So while dragging the cups along, so the shell wouldn't, that you wouldn't be able to see the shell, we had to adjust the height manually every time. So while setting multiple points, that caused us to almost set about 50 extra points because as the cup's sliding further, you ha we had to lift it as well or else it would crush the cup or indent the cup. Yeah, yeah, it'd be one thing if it was a spherical, you know, like a, a little ball or something, but that shell's got all sorts of edges to it, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's a great question, John. And uh, one of the things is that, again, uh, if the cup, and when you grip the cup and you can grip it very precisely and it doesn't slip, then uh, then you will not have those issues. It's just uh, because the way um, the gripper was and the, the way uh, the the uh, the pin on the cup which you're trying to hold, there is inaccuracies there and and any little inaccuracy because you're moving it on the surface of the table. It's not, you don't have much uh, space to. <laughs> to fudge there. So yeah, that makes it difficult uh, because it's a contact problem. So do you think that tooling is a big deal in, in this type of applications? Uh, just tooling in general? Uh, for this type of application that tooling and uh, designing the proper tooling and figuring out that is a big deal. Uh, I would say it's not, the, um, I wouldn't say uh, a proper tool, but uh, something a little different, maybe with uh, a little more, less contact to grab, mm -hmm. I would say, because um, I think we had more bending than anything when it would make contact. I see. I see. Yeah. I would say I more think. precision, where because we had on and off, if we had just percentages of how much it closed, I think that would have worked a little bit better. Uh, yes, if you are holding the cup, directly, uh, you would probably need a force control or servo gripper where you can control how much force you're using. But if you're still using a plastic cup, that again, you know, how much force do you apply before it just, you know, deforms? It yeah, can yeah. Really deform. So, so you have to keep all of those practical issues in mind when you do any kind of application like that. Uh, if you are doing precision and also all that. Yeah, and we also had to like adjust because we didn't know the gripper was going to be hollow inside, so we had mm -hmm. to fix the uh, like sticks attached to the cup to to account for that as well, and change our shell. So okay, yeah. yep. So I'm glad that those challenges is what you know makes you think about how to solve those yep. and make it work. And in the end, the main thing is you made it work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any any other questions for this group? Any last questions? Sure. Um, did you guys, when you were planning the path of how the cups move around, did you consider or attempt to use circular moves? Or did you guys just uh, try to use linear moves? Honestly, um, we didn't think about circular moves. We were thinking more just straightforward where it would be viewed from one point. But yeah. no, that's interesting. We didn't even come across that. So the, I think James raised a very good point there. These robots also have circular moves. And for this application, you know, moving it in a semi-circle, you know, switching place would, would look really cool also. 
Maybe yeah, so, maybe yeah. you can come back to the lab and modify your demo. <laughs> we'll keep it as a demo in the lab then. <laughs> That's a good demo. All right, uh, great job, guys. Thank you, thank you. Okay, and we are moving along. We're gonna go to uh, group number four, uh, who are, who's gonna present a fanat fanatic shoe cleaner. So take it away, group four. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Marco Wasif. Um, Vincent Tran. I'm Niso Dubewe. And uh, I'm excited to show you all today our uh, Fanatic 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 Shoe Cleaner. Our, our, by the way, our motto is why do it yourself when robots do it better? So we also had a uh, little problem with the clamp, so we used good old tape. So, um, so if you're a sneakerhead like me, uh, you know that shoes get dirty pretty often and shoe maintenance is mundane, but it's a very necessary task to keep your shoes in tip top shape. So this project introduces the phonetic shoe cleaner. It's a completely automated solution utilizing the precision of phonetic robotics to clean sneakers efficiently. And robots um, really are the future. So why not utilize them? Vinny? Go to the next slide. So the robot we used was the Fanic LR Mate 200 IC robot. Um, it control, uh, we used the teach pendant that Fanic made to control it. Um, utilizing world mode, we had six degrees of freedom. Uh, which provided the flexibility in motion and positioning our robot to clean the shoe. Uh, for tooling, the Fanic robot uh, was equipped with its own gripper that we had to use. Um, so we pro programmed it to pick up uh, the brush that had double-sided tape on it. And that's how we went around that problem. 
Um, and then being able to utilize the teach pendant uh, from FANUC uh, made programming the robot a lot easier due to its ease of use for recording points. Uh, this is because the FANUC teach pendant uh, allowed us to move each degree of freedom of the robot individually. So it made it easier to record the points as we were going along. Uh, and then on the next slide, you'll uh, see our, again, a picture of our setup. Um, and then advantages for our concept. Um, we thought it was efficient for industrial use because we are automating the cleaning process, um, which took away the need for manual labor and labor costs. Um, also consistency in cleaning results. So ensuring uh, uniform cleaning with uh, cleaning outcomes for every uh, used shoe. Um, we also thought it would be ideal for shoe companies dealing with used footwear um, by offering thorough cleaning to restore shoes to a new like condition before resale. Um, labor savings, again, um, promotes hygiene standards by utilizing automated cleaning processes. Um, and this reduces the risk of contamination and improving overall sanitation levels. Um, and then it's gentle yet effective cleaning mechanism uh, extends the lifespan of shoes by minimizing the wear and tear um, associated with manually brushing uh, or harsh cleaning methods. Next slide. So uh, real world applications. Uh, first we have uh, industrial level. This would be uh, dedicated for like plants for shoe cleaning where people could like ship in multiple of their shoes to be clean. And these places would have like stations for different types of uh, shoes ensuring effective cleaning and then they would be shipped back to the customers. And then next we have commercial implementation. This would be pla uh, place it, placement in stores that are selling shoes already, providing customers with on the spot cleaning or polishing services. This enhances customer experience and adds value to the store's products. And then my personal favorite is uh, the sports industry integration. Um, this would be implementation in like sports facilities for professional teams. This ensures uh, optimal performance and hygiene for athletes by cleaning shoes after uh, each game, inside and out. And then we have retailers of used shoes like uh, Vinny mentioned earlier. This would be a great investment for these uh, investment in like a uh, cleaning station by these companies selling a pre-owned shoes. This enhances profit margins and customer satisfaction, especially for platforms like StockX, Go, and eBay, who offer certified pre-owned shoes. And then uh, we have household. And then this would appeal to like the ultra-rich individuals with a wide variety of shoe collection. And it would provide um, convenience and maintenance for high-end footwear. Would be probably popular uh, among uh, popular celebrities. Uh, next slide. And then we have uh, future improvements. And then uh, we uh, we thought about uh, how we could improve on this. And uh, the first is rotational cleaning mechanism. Um, as you can see, we could not uh, get to every spot on the shoe due to the limited space. So this would implement a robotic uh, a robotic system with a rotating platform to hold the shoe while the other robotic arm performs scrubbing motions, ensuring a thorough clean of all parts. Then we have customized programs for each shoe. This would develop uh, multiple preset cleaning programs for different shoe types, including like running shoes, sports cleats, dress shoes, casual shoes, high top shoes, etc. And um, would optimize cleaning and uh, effectiveness and efficiency. And then we have variable cleaning intensities. This would introduce adjustable cleaning settings to provide different levels of cleaning intensities based on shoe condition and material, ensuring a gentle, clean, yet effective. Uh, and then we have the polishing functionality. This would be incorporated to polishing capabilities into the robotic system, enabling an automated polishing for like dress shoes to enhance their shine and appearance. And then lastly is our module tooling design. Uh, this would have specific uh, design tooling attachments with interchangeable brushes that seamlessly attach the robotic arm, allowing for versatile and cleaning different 
shoe materials and surfaces uh, so we don't have to use uh, double-sided tape. So <clears throat> to conclude us today, um, the robotic shoe cleaning system it re represents like a significant advancement in shoe maintenance. Um, you can leverage automation to like re revolutionize the way shoes are uh, cleaned and maintained. Um, by using the robot, we um, we have a potential to we have the potential uh, for like efficient, consistent, versatile cleaning solutions. Um, the advantages of our concept are beyond just industrial. We offer opportunities for like commercial ventures, sports facilities, like Niso said, retailers, and uh, individuals just seeking convenient, effective shoe cleaning solutions. As we continue to uh, innovate and refine our robotic uh, shoe cleaner, we are confident that the potential to revolutionize it um, in the robot industry and improve standards and providing convenience um, can be very valuable. And there's your uh, twist at the end. Thank you, group like, number four. <laughs> Can you unshare your screen? <laughs> All right. Um, so it looks like you have a whole shoe cleaning business set up suggested in your presentation. We're yeah. going to find these robots on the side of the street waiting for customers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. Let's, <laughs> let's open up for questions for the shoe cleaners. So I, I think in, in the presentation, when we were talking about the advantages, one of them, you missed the opportunity here. You know, how many of these poor shoe shine guys, I, I go to events all the time and there's always a shoe shine guy there looking for, for business for a few bucks. And all those chemicals they're using, right? I mean, you're saving this industry and these poor people from, from enduring the chemicals and, and substances that they have to encounter on a personal basis. Frequently, you have, a, you have the opportunity to have this sterile environment in which you can clean these shoes. That would have been a great, I think, advantage to share that insight. That's a great point. <laughs> He's already thinking ahead. <laughs> I'm also thinking about displacing that whole element of workers. <laughs> it's a little frightening, guys. <laughs> so actually, I had a question. Um, you designed this application for that particular shoe, right? You taught the point. How are you going to handle like different shoe sizes and shapes and even colors if you want to shine it brown or black? How would you do that? Right. That would be something where we would just have to make like a bunch of programs like, okay, um, like Niso said, certain type of running shoes, they kind of have the same formation. So we would probably make one for probably eight, size eight, size nine and a half, I don't know, 10, 10 and a half. Um, yeah, that, that would be how we would do it. Uh, other than that, that was something where we know knew choosing this project, we'd only focus on that specific shoe. So yeah, that would be how we do it. No, no, that's understandable. We, I didn't expect you to do all that in the demo, but uh, you know, just thinking ahead. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you have several different programs for different shoes. Is there any other way to make it like adjust to the shoe by looking at it without uh, some, you know same program? I think we could implement like some uh, machine vision that would take pictures and different points on the shoes. And then um, it would, based on the images, it would clean the shoe like that. Yeah, so that's that's an excellent uh, observation that uh, you could adjust your shoe strokes, like where to go and how how much to clean based on the vision feedback and how size mm -hmm. is. Yeah. Other questions for the group? So you guys got to deal with the, the, the fun challenge of singularity, I noticed. Um, if you had unlimited resources and you could do whatever you wanted with the robot or the, the tooling, um, what would you, if you can think of something off the fly, what would you change to help avoid getting into uh, singularity? Uh, 
Um, could I get a Did definition you... on singularity? And then I think I could answer that question. So when you were switching to the side of the shoe that was closest to the robot, mm -hmm. um, you noticed that axes four and six were almost in a perfectly straight line. So yep. your, your axis computer can't decide whether it needs to rotate axis six or four. So what ends up happening is you get into a weird twist and you actually pulled axis four upside down while rotating. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> just, just from looking at it, we run into this in the industry all the time. Um, just one suggestion, if you did, I know you guys were given the gripper in the lab and you were, you had to work with what you were given. Um, sometimes we'll offset, instead of having the gripper come straight out from the mounting flange, sometimes we'll have it be on like a 90 degree or 45 mm -hmm. degree angle. Mm -hmm. That way you can control because um, it's harder when you have a big, like a, a big robot path to be in and out of singularity all the time. Um, as you guys will probably find out from, from being in the lab, the robot will only move as fast as the slowest axis. Mm -hmm. So if you're spending a lot of cycle where you twist like axis four back and forth, axis four is usually one of the slowest axes on the robot. So if you guys had the opportunity to go back and redesign it and change the angle of the tooling that can help improve your throughput and clean more shoes. That's, that's an excellent observation, James. Uh, I missed that, uh, that, uh, and we talked about the singularity stuff in the class that, you know, when you go through it, one of your axes or more are, are gonna limit out on the speed and that causes your entire speed to slow down. Uh, getting near that singularity point. And what James is talking about is that if you avoid that completely, then you can plan better motions for uh, what you're trying to do. So that's a great observation there. Um, and, and, then, and actually, you know, this is, I mean, I, I did talk about in the class, but when you actually do the applications is when you know what, what limitations singularity causes when you're trying to do applications. Sometimes it's a big headache uh, when you're mm -hmm. trying to, definitely. Um, any last questions for the group? Hey, not so much a question, just kind of a further on, uh, you know, I think this is neat because uh, you talked about different places to use it. And I just think it's an interesting time to talk about you, you know, the, the robot companies have a model robot, but then they have different types of them. So for instance, with your shoe cleaning, like you said, you could have some on the street doing cleaning. That would just be a normal robot, right? But if you think a commercial business or like the, the OEM of the shoe cleans that shoe, well, they're probably going to make a clean room, right? They're going to make a clean room that's like electronic safe type clean room that's super clean. And you have to have a special robot that can go in that clean room. So it may be the same model, but different types of robots, same application, but different, you know, different environment will change the type, style, everything about it. So, you know, when you're talking to your customers in a few years about what type of robot you got to take environment and all that stuff into consideration. Great point, Joe. And robot selection is also a big, big deal when you are trying to figure out what is the right robot for your application. And hopefully maybe ABB can give us some collaborative robots which are safe around humans and perfect for this application. <laughs> I have to put my plug in. <laughs> yeah, we, we have them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, all right. Uh, good job, Group 4. Okay, um, we are moving on. We got three more groups to go. Um, and the next one, Group number 5 is going to present Typing Tommy. Go ahead, Group 5. Uh, Nick, are you sharing the screen? All right, I'll start. Hello, everyone. Our project is called Typing Tommy. My name is Servet Sulilari. I'm Joseph Nichols. Nichols Legato. Next slide.
If there is sound in the video, we're not hearing it. Uh, one sec. I don't know what's going on. Um, I guess we'll play with no sound. It's not working. When you share the screen, uh, make sure the checkbox for sharing sound is checked. Oh, I see. So okay, you gotta do a shared screen again. And try I can hear. You hear it now? Sorry, my bad. Yeah. My bad. My bad. A few moments later. Okay, so typing Tommy is our take on robotic automation for manually typing words or really any um, tasks that have repetitive um, points that need to be reached, whether it's uh, typing something on a keyboard or actuating um, buttons. And in this specific application, it interfaced with um, a keyboard and played a song. You can also you know, type things um, or it could even be used as part of a more complex system to play games and that sort of thing. And uh, initially we had, um, we wanted to make it customizable to where you could say, I want to type in, you know, you have like a box or something and you can pick what you want to type and you just say, you could form sentences easily. And then like the robot would automatically move there. But uh, just given the programming environment, it was easy to pre-program exactly what it's going to say in this application. And typing Tommy is more than a typing robot. Um, like I said, it can enhance productivity and have all kinds of applications for repetitive tasks. And I think especially where typing Tommy would excel is um, an application where it's like not safe or um, feasible for like a human to be doing something. So like a work environment where you, you want a robot doing that sort of thing and any repetitive tasks. And so as we got to programming it, um, first we just had it going from key to key, um, just like a person would, you know, typing, uh, like lifting up the finger. But when you do this with the robot and you actually run the program, it just drags. So what we had to do is implement a VIA system where it um, goes to a key, presses it, goes back up, and then goes to the next one. So that uh, solved our collisions. And we have a list of the um, commands that we carried out um, that you can see on the next slide. Okay, so going into how we uh, we mapped it. So first of all, this is kind of like going back to the video, um, the dialogue of what Tommy says, <clears throat> you know, he introduces himself and then states he can play a song. So moving on, this is like how we did it. So as you can see in these pictures, you have on the left side of each of them, there's like, uh, there's numbers and each of those numbers is a, po a point. So um, each letter or like any punctuation usually has three positions. So above and then up and then press and then above again, as you can see. Um, and then just altogether, this kind of shows a little bit of our, our dialogue portion of the, um, 
this uh, project. Uh, so moving on, this is um, the second part of the song. So this is kind of the, the mapping from the online piano notes to the actual keyboard keys. And then to um, go further in that, this is the same, same thing, but for the song portion, um, these letters you see um, at the top aren't the actual notes of the piano. These are the letters of um, like on the keyboard that were pressed. Um, once again, there, there's three positions above, press and above. And um, when the letter is repeated simultaneously, um, instead of going above, above, press, it's just above press. So it's one less position. Um, and then Servette. So we implemented at 50% speed in automatic mode. And the reasoning for 50% speed is because we wanted to give uh, some room for the web browser page to open due to insufficient internet bandwidth in the lab. Uh, lower speed also equals lower chances. Uh, next slide, please. No, oh, chances later, I mean. Next slide. Uh, tool selection ca categories. So we ended up- yeah, I have a look into my closet again and my user. Okay. Uh, so, uh, tool selection categories. So uh, we ended up deciding- yeah. to use oh, yeah, that just hold on to it. Uh, I'm not sure who's speaking, but uh, we uh, decided to use the robot pointer length to uh, reduce uh, misalignment. So that was a key component. We were looking for length. We were looking for sturdiness of the robot pointer because if you uh, if it's not sturdy enough, it's going to slide on the keyboard. And then uh, we were looking for sufficient force applied to the pointer to, uh, to the key stroke reliably so we could get whenever we uh, we would click a key, it will uh, reliably display. Uh, next slide, please. Some project uh, obstacles that we had to face is that uh, the robot can only do one thing at a time. It cannot do copy paste uh, at the same time. So the way we went around that on uh, Microsoft Word, we mapped the right bracket uh, to be the copy paste or the control V uh, to copy the link to open the web page. Uh, we meticulously double checked uh, for any du uh, duplicate letters. So uh, every every time we uh, mapped out one key, we double checked it's not jittering or anything. Next uh, slide. Uh, some more uh, obstacles that we had to face was uh, what kind of keyboard should we use? So we ended up deciding to go with the Amazon Basics keyboard due to its mid-height uh, keys, and that's optimal for clicking. We assess quick movements to double check any unintended notes uh, again. And then we also ran the robot at 50, 75% and 100% speed uh, to double check, hey, maybe the song will sound better at 75% speed. Uh, but that was not the case with the higher speed. So we ended up just uh, keeping it at 50% uh, due to we wanted to keep the song clarity as a priority. All right, next slide. Some future improvements we would like to make with a pro uh, project is maybe improve uh, the pointer. So maybe use like a stylus uh, pen pointer uh, to mimic the thumb. We wanted to uh, do that for adjustable pressure settings, uh, integrate machine vision for the future. I believe Joy talked about that a little bit in the beginning, uh, how we could uh, do multiple uh, words uh, at the same time and change between them. And uh, we also uh, want to lay the keyboard completely flat. That does help quite a bit. Uh, in our instances, we tried to keep it as flat as we could, but uh, the keyboard was moving a little bit. So we uh, ended up uh, taping the bottom. So when the force was applied on it, it did not move. Next slide, please. And conclusion and summary. So altogether, the project took 276 points of positioning. Tommy Tommy uh, was created and we took inspiration from Atomica, the video that the professor played in our uh, class. And uh, we definitely see how we could uh, continue from a minor piano online player to musical instruments in the future. Thank you. Thank you, group number five. Good job, good demo. So you should have named a musical typing Tommy. Yeah, two uh, applications in one. <laughs> we didn't want to give it away. 
<laughs> That's true. Very true. Um, mu playing, typing is by itself a challenge, but playing music, you have the added issue of timing. You got to time your moves exactly so that the music sounds good. So yeah, so you got the double whammy there. <laughs> Anyway, let's open up for questions for group number five. I am curious about the the depressing of the keys, right? There's a there's a point at which it engages the keyboard so that the keystroke is actually recognized. How did you discover that? I mean, at some point you had to you had to come down far enough, and then okay, so it 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 engage the keyboard in a way that the the keystroke was recognized in you the had to keep doing that in that same way was there was there any variability on the keys i guess the, the keyboards are really the magic of this thing i think right uh it was a lot of trial and error in the beginning but uh after a few uh, plots uh actually we decided to use the mid uh stroke high of the key so choosing the right keyboard actually did help quite a lot uh, we did uh, implement some smaller keyboards and it was jitter jittering quite a bit. Uh, so keyboard selection was one, uh, trial and error. And uh, from there, uh, particularly in the beginning, the space bar gave us some, uh, gave us some jittering mostly. Uh, and then for that was going, uh, clicking at the center of the key helped a lot. Like as close as we could get to the center. Did, did you yeah, have I, any variability or flexibility with respect to, or did you want any different uh, end effector, for instance, on this? Would, would it have helped if you had a broader one, a softer one? Uh, it would probably help for the keyboard to be more sturdiness, I guess. So the keys take more force to, uh, to be clicked. Okay. So your compliance was in the key itself. So you're making contact, but there is a give in the keyboard to, you know, if a little bit of position error, the key can handle that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I guess uh, a finger-like, <laughs> instead yeah. of a pointer-like, a finger-like uh, a tool would have been maybe better because the keyboard is designed for fingers, right? Yep, and uh, that's why we wanted to add that in the improvement list. We wanted to go with a pointer pen style, stylus. Mm -hmm. So it actually has that pressure. Okay. Yeah, I, I would also like to add on that um, to like the initial question. Mm -hmm. We've had several times where we like couldn't like we'd press it, and then since it was like just a little bit lighter than it should have been, when we would like do our trial runs, it like it would miss a key, or even there'd be times where it we, like we'd have too much pressure, and you can kind of see like the keyboard like press down like like the whole keyboard press down a little bit. So we had to just like um, I guess edit the pressure essentially to get it just in the like the, the the middle point of that so yeah that was what i was getting at yeah, yeah. That was, i was wondering if you had any difficulty in and repeatability on that so that thank you yep yeah uh, i have a question regarding the uh the way you program each one of those keystrokes you had a point which you taught above and then the actual press point and then above why did you have two different above points? Could you use the same above point? Or did you use the same above point? So actually, yeah, I didn't, we didn't really, um, I, so I believe in the beginning we kind of did that, um, but since some keys, so yeah, yeah, so we did that originally, but I guess our above wasn't high enough, which I guess we didn't really think of, but um, we kind of did the above press above on the same key just to kind of like, even make, even like make it look smoother, but um there was times where the key would, or the, I'm sorry, the stylus would actually like almost half press another button on the way just because we didn't make it high enough, but I can see where you're coming from. That probably would have been a little bit better if we had a higher up, like centralized, you know, like main point above, but um, I hope that answers it. Okay. Yeah, no, I was just curious about this. Any more questions for this group? When you were having problems of, with the keyboard sliding when you were pushing the keys, is that because you were, were, were you, did you teach your points straight up and down when pressing the keys or did you reorient the tool to be pressing it perpendicular to the key? 
So uh, it was mostly sliding when we were doing uh, the faster speeds. That's when it was mostly sliding. Uh, at, at lower speeds, it was, uh, you couldn't really see it, but uh, it was very slightly moving. So that's why we had to tape it. Uh, but uh, all our motions were not perpendicular. We were going completely straight down. Did you guys try uh, like teaching a user frame to the keyboard for that offset on the angle? So uh, for that, uh, uh, we we did not do any uh, any angling uh, uh, of of uh, training of the keyboard or of oh. the rope. I mean, okay. And uh, another point I want to make an observation is you know these types of uh, applications where you have a you know, like a matrix, a keyboard matrix, instead of uh, programming each one of them individually, uh, you could do indexed moves there, where you just have the above, down, above, and if the keyboard is flat, then you can say, well, I wanna offset my move in X and Y by this to go to the next key, to the next key. So your motion, your points are taught separately, like three points, but that index will take you to different keys. So there are, you know, another other ways to do these applications where you have repetitive, very um, grid-like layout for points. So of course these are advanced types of motion. But just to think of, as you went through and taught so many points, you would really appreciate if you could do that way. Other applications, similar applications. Um, any last questions for this group? All right, great job, group number five. Thank you. And we're gonna move on to group number six and they're gonna be stacking cups. Go ahead, group six, take it away. Let's see here. <clears throat> Make sure that sounds good. All right, can you guys see this? No, not yet. Nothing? Let me try this again. Let's see here, share screen. Alrighty. How about now? Yep, we can see it. Awesome. So this is our project. This is a uh, slalom stat cup involving the ABB IRB one twenty robot. My name is Zachary Jump. I'm John Azum. I'm Zach Hill. And I'm Aiden Gallagher. Perfect. So this is the project itself. Um, they should start playing here. So we did uh, front and side point of view.
So uh, we chose cup stacking as a team. We wanted to um, do a procedure that was familiar with spectators. Uh, obviously, cup stacking is something that many people have uh, participated in as a game um, throughout their life. Um, so it would be more entertaining for them to, to spectate from. Uh, but we also wanted something that was uh, repeatable, a routine that could uh, be repeatable, and something that if we have more time and, and further on, we could uh, actually unstack the cups and send it through a kind of an infinite loop um, and to mess with uh, precision and speed at that point, if we had that that extra time. Um, knowing the ABB robot is designed to be very precise, uh, this is why we chose this project, is to uh, kind of slow through um, these uh, cups to uh, kind of display how it'd be in real world uh, applications. So to itself, uh, it was a pneumatic jaw. Uh, it was an aluminum gripper. Um, there were some limitations with this. Of course, the hose lines could snag cups as it passes through. We noticed that while we were teaching some of the routines, uh, is something that we we're cautious about. And then also over rotating uh, this, this robot could potentially pull on these hoses and break valves. So it's just something that we looked out for. So when I uh, first received the cups, I noticed uh, two things. So number one was that, I don't know if this is going to show up on camera. I'm only using two fingers and like, I'm almost like bending the cup to half its size. So they're super flimsy and flexible. And then the second thing was because of the tooling limitations that were just mentioned, there wasn't actually a reliable way to grab the cup. So we needed to modify the cups in some way. So my initial idea, which ended up being the one that we ran with, was I took Home Depot's finest. I took like a quarter inch piece of plywood and this three eighths uh, square dowel. And I just mated them like this with the uh, cup in between them. And I just gave like a much more consistent platform so the uh, robot could actually grab the uh, cup. And I specifically chose three eighths because that left us exactly 2.74 mils of clearance on either side of the dowel. If I went one size up, that would have only left one mil of clearance on either side. And that, that I felt like that was way too tight of a tolerance for wood. So I, I went with three eighths. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. But one of the um, big issues that, a couple issues we ran into actually, so there's actually like a plastic hump in the center of the cup. So for me to like drill the through hole for the screw to actually mount it, it wasn't always perfectly centered every single time. So the rods weren't exactly dead center every single time. And so what that meant was um, the cup placement had to be pretty close to perfect in the actual cell in order for the routine to actually run. And these uh, cups that you see on the slide uh, are what happens when the cup isn't perfectly placed. Uh, the, it will, the robot would just push the rod straight through the cup and break it. But there was also, uh, on one of those cups actually, was a user error. Uh, we were jogging the robot to the, um, the plan was to jog it to like the pick approach, but not the actual like go into the pick position, but we pressed the forward button one too many times and the cup was not aligned. So it, it broke the cup. But to talk more about the um, trajectory planning and just some general, the general routine, I will hand it off to Zach. Yeah, so like Jump said, um, we're, we're used to seeing like just the normal cup stacking, right? So you, I don't know if you guys did in elementary school where you stack the cups and then you stack them down. And so we couldn't really stack the cups on top of each other because of the modifications that John was just talking about. So we had to put the, we had to put the dowels on there. So we thought we should do something more interesting than, than just grabbing the cups and putting them in a pile. So that's when we added the slalom. So we just had the cups go through the, the course you saw in the video and then the higher level cups we made do a different thing. And so when we, um, like the V motion where the cup went over the stack was where we were um, encountering a lot of our errors to kind of teaching the joint positions to get 
the cup into the right orientation to go over the cups without knocking the dowels and messing up the stack, which would mess up all of the points, um, was kind of difficult. And that's where we ended up breaking some of the cups. And then for the last one, we wanted to kind of just do a bunch of loops and kind of go to the limitations of the robot, which is why I ended up being so slow because we were reaching some of getting close to some of those singularities. And so, um, that was the long move at the end. And then when we were in the, um, the higher level cups, so the second row, they had to be stacked between the dowels and we didn't have a lot of space. So that's kind of where we were relying on the precision of the ABB robot. So we got just in there and then like manually, and then we, uh, went directly up and taught that point as the approach point and then went straight down and just like, like right above the cup. So we didn't crash into it and break the, the, the lower cups. Um, I think that's about it for, for the trajectory planning. Um, the, the move at the end where we knocked over the cups was just kind of a little fun twist that we wanted to throw in there. Um, if we had stacked it on the top, we could have sent the robot back to a home position and then just done the reverse. And like Zach was saying earlier, made it a repeatable process. Okay, so like Zach was saying, with uh, because we can't exactly slalom the last cup around anything because the tower is almost already built, we kind of wanted to do a bunch of like funky movements just to kind of because picking up the the cup from the from the dowel and moving it to the top wouldn't be like it wouldn't be showcasing anything enough, and so we also wanted to pretend like it was it was going to complete the tower because we're not looping this. We we just wanted to knock the tower down, but uh. I don't know if you're able to, see, able to see in the video, but the, the cup doesn't actually make contact with the second row before it raises and then it uh, knocks the cups over. And not all the cu cups knock over, but um, maybe if the speed were higher, then um, we get a better result. Yes, there were some errors encountered along the way. A um, couple locations, so while teaching these points, uh, cups are sagged. However, when it comes to resetting the routine, uh, cups must be placed exactly where they were previously since those points were already taught. Uh, the way we went around that was uh, we put the uh, tool in the position where it is before it picks up the uh, cup from the doll, and then we just place the doll right in between and set it in there. It was something that um, just had to be very cautious with, uh, make sure everything was squared up when resetting the routine. Um, within the first routine, we noticed that there was a delay time that we'd have to involve um, due to the tool coming down uh, and then actually lifting up. And once it lifted up, it would then um, close the gripper. Um, so it was not picking up the cups. It was actually above the cups. It was closing. Um, so we installed a delay time right there. And then, uh, as John mentioned before, there were some trajectory issues, uh, mostly user error where uh, sometimes the user would just move the cursor in the wrong spot and then hit play or, or press the four button one too many times, which led to us cracking some of the cups. Um, cup two is very close to a singularity as um, cup two location uh, had to be changed a few times to avoid this issue. And then the conclusion. So overall, it was a good takeaway uh, for our team. Um, we saw some real amount of, or real life applications on how this could be used in the real world, um, mostly with material handling and, and tight workspaces. Um, it, that would be the main application. And the uh, cup stacking uh, ended up being a great way to demonstrate the robot's precision and repeatability. Uh, I'm not sure if you saw from the video, but we actually ended up tracing the um, dowels up and we we're trying to see how close we could get to the cups without actually touching them. Um, this is kind of just a fun part of us playing around with the robot's capabilities and and how close we could get. Um, but yeah, the, like I said, there are some limitations. Um, you know, we had to we had to work around and, and think outside the box and on, on some modifications. And but overall, it was a, uh, a fun experience. Thank you for your attention. Any any questions? Thank you, group number six. Good job. Good demo. All right. Uh, very mysterious moves stacking those cups. <laughs> yeah. We were enjoying those funky moves. Yeah, a good job there. All right, let's open up for questions here. You know, uh, your fellow students, you can ask questions too. 
Don't be shy. If you have any. I'll just start off by saying I'm very partial to AVB. They're definitely my favorite robots to work with. Um, so good choice by picking AVB. Um, when you guys were, were experimenting with your air moves, um, you know, the, one of the best ways to learn is to, is to play around with it. But, um, one, one thing I was curious if you, if you played with the, uh, the zones, did you guys play with the zones at all when you were changing the moves? Uh, no, we just kept everything to the, uh, default zone. Okay. Do you guys know how the zones work? Uh, vaguely like i understand like you could set like safety zones or like different work zones <clears throat> for the um so the zones and the movement is like a you, you can consider it like rounding so the zone you'll see like i think the default is z50 um that's saying you know you teach your point here in space let's say we have just a very simple right angle if i teach this this middle point with with z50 once it hits, it's going to round this corner and stay 50 millimeters, 50 millimeters away from that point. So you can play with that um, if, you know, when you have like tighter applications or your final set down points, you always want to use a fine point so that the robot will actually stop at those positions before it continues. But um, for some of the air moves, you can play around and actually get faster speeds by raising the zone. You can go up to Z200 as a is an op uh, built in option. Okay. If I ever find myself in the lab again, I'll, I'll have to play with it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point, James. And of course, these are advanced moves. <laughs> and <coughs> excuse me, I wish we had a second course where they could man go ahead and do some serious application, industrial applications. Hopefully, they do it in the in their careers, in their jobs. So I'm looking forward to hearing. Uh, if they actually join a robotic company or do robotic applications, that'll be really cool. Yeah. More questions for the group. So uh, again, an observation. I, I just think it's so interesting when you guys do all this because to watch what you have to do through the process, especially you took the pictures here, it just, it emphasizes again, like if you guys get into robotics um, and you go into system integrators, it, it how much engineering happens outside of the robot you know when you, you're you're discovering how to make the cups more adaptable and you're discovering how to strengthen that your your material up and and there's so much that goes into again just making sure things are are nice and aligned and uh, I, I thought that was just a, a super interesting like real world example of like what it takes to get this stuff to be very precise and you know uh you, you talked about operator error all the time I, I run customer service for AVB in the U.S. and I get probably ten calls a day because operator error. You know, we, we want uh, we want our customers to call us first because when they get too brave and they don't take classes, they uh, they call me later because of operator error. So make sure that your customers later on in the future uh, get training and understand how to how to use the robots um, so that it helps them out and they're, they're successful. Uh, and finally, when I saw that you guys. Uh, we're, we're wanted to stay about two and a half millimeters away. I thought, oh, the ABB can get closer. <laughs> you can get, get it to a minute, get it to a millimeter. It can get there. The mm -hmm. ABB will get there for you. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, Joe. Um, yeah, the real world, when you're trying to solve real world problems, that's the, that's the fun part. And you, you know, you're the second group which discovered that plastic club, uh, plastic cups are flimsy. You can't just grab them with the gripper, especially if you just have a just binary position gripper, uh, you know, open and closed. You can't do that. Uh, you have to use um, pressure control if you really have to grab them from the side. And also, you know, when you're talking about trying to drill a hole at the center of the cup where there's a bump, so between us, don't do that outside of this class. You could use a solder iron, right? Just poke through at the center, bumps and all, it'll make a hole. <laughs> I, I won't tell True. anyone. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I even love the point, you know, even your point about the the hosing, you know, and the, the 120 has a hosing like that, but, and the diff, the newer models don't have that much hosing. But again, when you guys, when you guys go into your businesses and your mechanical engineers are designing your end of arm tools and your grippers, when your grippers are trying to lift like 50 kg, 
material and engine blocks and and stuff like the it's the end of arm tools that will have the hosing because of the it needs the the air or, or whatever however you're forcing it, or electrical wires and you just have to take into account that yeah you can't just whip those things around because they'll get caught on something so i, I just again the whole process i think was really pretty neat so thank you am yeah, i allowed you. to ask a, a follow-up question sure uh so or you were talking earlier about um like possibly changing parts versus changing like the robot at like a customer site. So how uh, how do you two like come together to figure out if the robot has to change or if the part has to change? That's a great question. Um, a lot of times, so at least in our business, we 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 design all this stuff in. We design like some of the parts internally. Uh, I will tell you that a lot of. Um, heated discussions between customers can be uh, we see this quite a bit where our robots can be so accurate and then when it doesn't keep when it doesn't work we then pull out the part prints and we measure the tolerances of the part prints so sometimes you have a part that is um um you know made in a foundry and well the foundries can be pretty inaccurate so if you get a part that comes out and it's and it's and it's made wrong and the tolerances are off um and you get a you get a certain level of those, you can have to go back to the customer and say, look, your part's out of tolerance. You told me to make this, you know, I made this, this, uh, this cell, this engineering cell to, to fit within a certain tolerance of, you know, a millimeter and a half and your part is two millimeters. Well, it's not going to work. Right. So those are, again, those are just, that's, that's the art of customer relationships. So you kind of have to have those conversations about uh, whether their part is, or the, whether they're asking you to do too much that their own, uh, that the customer can't even handle. So it, especially we see that quite a bit sometimes. I shouldn't say quite a bit, but when you're talking in, when you're talking in, you know, uh, half mils and microns and all that kind of stuff, that can, you can really get into part tolerances on, on drawings. Does that help? Does that answer your question? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's always good to hear insight like that. Cause I mean, at school, you're just kind of learning theory, but stuff like that, you don't you really learn till you're in industry. Yeah, I mean, so the sci the science is getting the robot to be within a millimeter where you want it to be and repeat, you know, on a very tight tolerance. The art is going to your customer and saying, uh, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Customer, your part isn't exactly as accurate as you said it was, and you better go get me some new parts. <laughs> My favorite thing to tell customers is uh, the robot's going to the same spot every time. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't buy them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, repeatability for the robots is super good. Yeah, you can't argue with that. Yeah, um, that's very good, true. Good discussion. So uh, this is the whole idea of this, that, you know, getting industry viewpoint, uh, all of us benefit from that. Thank you very much for sharing all that. Uh, sure. And thank you, group number six. Good job. Yes, thank you. And finally, we have the last group uh, today, group number nine. And they're going to do Robo's talk. Take it away, Group Nine. Hi, we have the Robo Stock presentation robot, and um, my name is Ishra Badat. My name is Francesca Cipriano. I'm Joshua Seafarth. Here is our tip.
So for our um, presentation, we got to use the Fanic robot and we made a shelf and then pieces that kind of resembled food in order to mimic um, stocking a shelf or a pantry. Um, we made the our, we made the blocks and the shelf out of wood. This way, the shelf would stay put because sometimes the wires on the robot arm would um, push against the shelf and we didn't want to make sure that it wouldn't move. And when it came to the gripper itself, the Fanuc robot gripper was a little bit smaller um, than what we would have liked. But in order to not make a new gripper attachment, we had to make our pieces thin enough to fit in the gripper, but also enough where they could stand up on their own. And we also created markings on the ground where you can kind of see in that picture. So in case we had to go back and um, see if all the steps were working in order, we made sure that the food or the boxes were in the same spot every single time. So the FANUC robot is the six degree of freedoms. And this was nice for, um, it gave us a wide range of motion and flexibility. So the robot could reach around obstacles and access the parts from various angles, um, making it suitable for stocking tasks. So the design feature um, makes the robot compact, which is good. So it could be used for like confined spaces of aisleways um, due to like the slim profile that it has and the small footprint of the base. And the robot can perform these tasks quickly and accurately, um, increasing productivity and efficiency in a workplace where it was being used. So our design and challenges revolve around determining the approach points for the robot. We needed to find the optimal positions from which the robot can reach the items efficient, efficiently while navigating the workspace safely. Factors such as reachability, clearance, and workspace limitations played a crucial role in the decision-making process. Ensuring smooth navigation without collisions or obstacles was significant for us. For our next challenge, we had to decide the sequence in which the robot would pick up the mini boxes of cereal slash snacks. This this decision significantly impacted the efficiency of our stocking process. We're strategizing the order based on factors such as proximity and accessibility. By optimizing the pickup sequence, we aim to minimize unnecessary movements and maximize efficiency. Our third challenge involved planning the trajectory of the robot's movements. It's essential to ensure safe and precise handling of the items throughout the stocking process, as we could potentially crash the robot into the shelf. Factors such as speed and collision avoidance are critical considerations in trajectory planning. So we carefully mapped out the robot's path by setting the approach points and keeping in mind the accessibility and orientation of the items being picked up. So in hindsight, we had to work our way from the outside in. Finally, our last challenge focused on defining the exact placement coordinates for each item on the shelves. So achieving a neat and organized arrangement was essential for a visually pleasing and functional pantry. So we're considering factors such as shelf height, spacing between items, and alignment to ensure cons consistent and accurate placement. So for other applications or other like industries that it could be used, there's the retail, the food um, industry, and the healthcare. So for retail, um, it could be used for accurate and timely restocking or reducing like the out-of-stock situations in order to make the customers happy. Um, in the food services, it could streamline inventory management, optimize the storage, and also help prevent expired food with rotating all the foods. Um, and in a healthcare setting, it could assist in organizing the medical supplies, um, ensuring availability, and then this can allow the employees to focus more on the patient care. So with labor saving, when it comes to the robots, they can do the task of the employees. So it wouldn't... Um, we wouldn't need employees to stock anything anymore. Now, in the beginning, it would be expensive because the robots are expensive themselves, but in the long run, it might benefit the um, company because they wouldn't be needing to um, pay the employees where they could just buy the robot. And for the safety, these robots do have the ability to work um, either morning or night when there aren't any customers there. So that would help with safety. But if there, it was going to work when people were there or other employees, then the safety would have to lo be looked more into in order to keep the people safe. In conclusion, our project showed how to, a small implementation of stocking uh, shelves with using the FANUC robot could set like a new standard for automating and showcasing the potential to enhance efficiency across diverse settings from grocery stores, warehouses, pharmaceutical places, 
any place that you could use that someone else is stocking a shelf or an item. And uh, um, using the precise pre precision points and speed of the boxes or product you're going to do, you could go through and create new trajectories, uh, pro pro approach points, and plan different ways to uh, stock your shelves. This could offer significant advantages, like Fran said, in labor sa savings and scalability and safety across key sectors in the world. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Group 9. Good job. Good demo. All right. Uh, we are open for questions. Okay, I have one. And I think it might have to do, I might know the answer to this. And I suspect, I'm, I'm, by the way, I am not a robot expert. I am, I'm not even a robot novice. I'm a robot know nothing. So I'm just asking a question here based on my, my limited knowledge. Dan, you are now uh, at least a robot, uh, uh, you know, somewhat expert by attending these presentations. So I wouldn't say you're a novice anymore. <laughs> I'm learning as as I watch these presentations. So thank you, everybody. But the the question I have is, the grippers were located at a different spot on each one of the boxes. One would be picked up by the corner. Another one might be picked up in the mid vertical. Another might be picked up on the top center. Was that because of the intended location on the shelf? What was the what was the reason for the different locations of the grippers on each one of the boxes? Yeah, well, the reasoning we had was um, the robot can't fully move 360 in the space that it has. So being able to grab the little box from the place that we wanted to was so that it could fit into the shelf at the exact orientation we needed it to fit into. So for example, in one of our boxes, when we grabbed it from the top right corner, it's because it was going in straight. But for some of them that we grabbed from the top, we had to flip them because they were they were horizontal, not vertical. So if we picked them, then we had to flip it. So if we picked it up from the corner, we wouldn't have been able to flip it completely to a 90 degree angle. So that's why we had to pick it up from different spots. It was also easier to do it that way because when we picked up the next box, we could keep that same orientation. Yeah, plus we want to make it a little bit challenging because if we would have kept the um, orientation of the arm the entire, the same the entire what, the entire time, then we could have just easily picked up each box and put it in the shelf. But we want to make it a little bit more challenging by picking up the boxes by different angles and trying to get them into the shelf. Nice. Mm -hmm. uh, I also noticed that uh, the clearance of the box and the shelf was quite tight there. So it was almost skating in the cereal boxes on the shelf. <laughs> it looked nice. <laughs> I, I wonder if you had issues when you were programming that. Yeah, um, we, had, we had a couple issues, um, especially with um, the approach. That's why the approach points were necessary, because if we went in too fast, it would knock into the shelf or like bend the wood, which actually happened to one of our shelves at, or one of our boxes at one point. So that's why approach points were necessary so that it would slowly just slide into the exact spot we wanted it to go into. Yeah, and if anyone had noticed, um, the first box that we put down, it actually kind of dropped the box and luckily it landed. And that was because um, one of our points actually got messed up once we like finished and we had to reteach the point, but we didn't spend too much time on making sure it was in the exact same spot um, from the first time. So it kind of just dropped the box and it landed. Well, you guys learned the importance of approach point the hard way then. <laughs> Yeah, this is necessary for doing applications, you know, from approach point to the actual final point is a very controlled move because you maybe have very little clearance or you want to control the speed and linear moves and all that stuff can happen at that point. So good job there. Um, other questions for this group? Uh, yeah, I got a question. Uh, did you guys ever consider uh, doing dominoes with your boxes instead? No. A short and sweet answer. All right. <laughs> Noted. Well, I actually I was expecting at the end you're gonna knock over those <laughs> those boxes in the final move. 
Yeah, we were thinking of that, like making that the twist. But then I was thinking like in real world applications, I don't think there would be a reason for you to just knock down all the boxes on the shelf. So that's why I didn't want to put it into the actual project. Why not? The robot can get angry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in real world, uh, if you're doing a food application like the one you simulated, uh, the, the one of the challenges is how the uh, the boxes are coming in. They're not like placed around nicely where you can pick up and place. I understand with the, uh, the limited time, that's the only way you could do it. Um, so the other ways you do it is either they're coming in a bin. So you have to, uh, very important application in industry is bin picking. So that uses vision to pick up correctly the boxes and then place them on the shelf. And the other way that they could be coming on a conveyor, again, you would use vision there. So that's uh, the uh, robots are extensively used in the food industry for packaging and various applications and vision is very, very commonly used because food is so unstructured sometimes, you know, so you have to use properly pick it up and then place it nicely where it belongs. Yeah. Any last questions for the group? Hi, I have a question. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Did you all try any um, other speeds to um fill up like the pantry? Like, did you try it at any other faster speeds to see how fast it could go or anything like that? No, we actually didn't. We just kept it at one speed. And then after we were, after we finished it, we thought that we could have put it in other speeds, but we just did it at the one speed. Okay, thanks. Great project. Thank yeah, you. We are severely limited at safe speeds for all the uh, robots in our lab just for safety in the lab. So I know some of these application can benefit from high speeds, but again, safety comes first in the lab. Yeah. All right, uh, if there are no last questions, uh, good job, group number nine. Okay, uh, I have to remind everyone that if you, if the videos were coming out jittery, it's because of this, uh, you know, the Zoom session and we have so many people on it. So I, I would suspect that sometimes it's not very smooth, but I will be posting all these videos on on YouTube and I will be sharing the link. So if you want to see them again in full glory, you will be able to do that. And uh, so watch out for that. I'll share that link with everyone once I have them up on YouTube. Um, so uh, before we Sign off here. And uh, any of any comments from our guests here? Any last comments for our students? I'd just like to offer my sincere appreciation for the the knowledge and expertise that you've generated here. It's it's really it's really impressive from my standpoint. Maybe not from Joe and James, you know, but from from mine. Well done. Thank you, Dan. It's the effort of the students and uh, I give them full freedom to think of any application. It's all their hard work and effort and whatever they learned in the course, I see good applications of that happening. So they are on a right path. Yeah, hey, look, I, I thought it was great. Um, you are on the right path. You know, no matter, um, you know, just watching all these, remember that robots will do whatever you want them to do, right? But it starts out with, it starts out with a common sense approach to your problem. It starts out with some good imagination. It starts out with you having a vision of what the cell is supposed to look like to get your customer's needs done. So um, I, I just think it's a great, uh, no matter what the technology lets you do, you have to start the engineers and the people working on this have to start the vision. And so, you know, just keep that in mind that the robots will do whatever you want it to do, but you, you got to start with the basics of, is this cell going to do what I needed to do for my customer? Very good point. If if anyone who's going through these projects, if you have interest in this industry, um, you are in the heart of Automation Alley. There are so many system integrators. There's so many suppliers with all kinds of technology, and it's a constantly evolving world. So if it's something that's interesting to you, there are plenty of opportunities locally to get into it. Thank you, James. 
I yeah. just wanted to jump in and just say you all uh, did such an amazing job. Everything is very creative and impressive. So great job, everyone. Thank you very much, Ernesta. And we have six more exciting demonstrations next week. So join us for episode number two. And uh, hopefully most of you, uh, I'm talking to the guests, you can, you're, you're able to join us next Wednesday, same time, same channel. And we'll see you then. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank job, you. everyone.